Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Jessica Ward King here, also known as the Stigma Crusher. And it is Mental Illness Awareness Week this week. So from October the 3rd to October the 8th is Mental Illness Awareness Week in North America at the very least. And um, it, it's really important that we have weeks like this. And some people have said to me, well, there's Mental Health Awareness Week in May. Now there's Mental Illness Awareness Week in October. Like, why do we need all this, these weeks? Mental health is everywhere more often than anything these days. Everyone's talking about mental health. Like, why do we need all these days? And as a person from the LGBTQ2 community, I have a few thoughts on this because I get the same comments every year when we have pride parades and when we have pride week um, and even pride month now in June. Um, people say to me like, the struggle is over. People are accepted. Why do we need these weeks? Because the struggle is far from over is my answer. The struggle for people with mental illness is really only beginning. So in terms of a history of um, living with mental illness, people have lived with mental illness since time began. The, the brain has been going wrong. Emotions and cognitions have been going wrong since people began to be people. Um, and they've been ostracized almost as long. Um, and because of odd behaviors, because of beliefs about these odd behaviors, where they come from in terms of, you know, demonic possession or in terms of, you know, a blight from, uh, from the gods or whatever the case may be, um, people have been looked at as very different um, when they are struggling with symptoms of mental illness. And those differences are rarely um, celebrated, let's say. So they're, they're very often stigmatized. And we obviously don't know what happened in the cradle of civilization and how mental health stigma um, really began. But we do know that as long as we have recorded history of human settlements, that we've had recorded history of stigma against mental illness. And there was some, I mean, we... In the early 19, the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a real push to get people that were really struggling with mental illness into asylums, out of the streets, out of their families, out of their communities where they were being cared for. They were being, you know, seen as maybe a little eccentric, a little different, but um, but nonetheless somehow cared for by their relatives um, and their community. But into asylums where they could be. The idea originally was where they could be treated and healed, but really they were they were stored away. They were. It, it was inhumane conditions in a lot of the sanatoriums and a lot of the asylums that were there. Um, really inhumane conditions. People were shoved in there to be forgotten, to be to be put away and not in polite society. And, and that's something that's interesting. Like when you look at um, currently at societies in our in our current day world where those people where that that institutionalization hasn't happened or didn't happen um, and where those people are still cared for in the community there are communities where the mentally ill are cared for in their homes are cared for by their families um, and some of the argument is that their, their lives are better for it and so what happened with institutionalization is they all got put away forgotten about definitely stigmatized. Those asylums were, were very much stigmatized. And that's where we, we get, and you'll hear me talk about this, I'm sure, at Halloween, we get the current idea and the almost romanticization of the asylum as something that, that's frightening and, 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 and horrifying and terrifying. Um, but what happened then uh, was, and this is like the briefest history of, of psychiatry, I suppose, but what happened then was that drugs were developed that were able to treat some of the most troubling symptoms of serious mental illness. And so what I'm talking about when I say serious mental illness, I'm really talking about psychosis, so like the hallucinations and delusions, those positive features of psychosis, um, psychotic depressions, bipolar disorder with mania or psychotic features, those are the ones that we're really looking at as serious mental illness, catatonia, those kinds of things um, and so it and those of you and those of me that struggle with kind of your bog standard um, depressive episodes are kind of like hey mine is serious yes it is I'm not saying it's not what I'm saying is that, that back in the day the folks that were in the asylums were the were the folks that couldn't function in society that couldn't that were, were having those symptoms that were so troubling and so drugs were developed in the, the mid 1900s that were able to treat those. So the first antipsychotics, the first mood stabilizers, they were able to treat those most troubling symptoms. And 
then we started to see people getting better. Maybe not all better, not cured, but getting better. And some people were able to leave the asylums. And then post World War II, there was there were some damning looks inside those asylums and the American and Canadian publics kind of got this wake up call of like, oh, wow, that's not what we thought was going on in there. Like, I don't know what we thought was going on in there, but it wasn't that people living in feces and whatnot. Um, and so there was a shift towards deinstitutionalization. And so basically what happened is that the idea was sound. The idea was great is get the people out of these horrifying institutions back into society where they can integrate, where they can get jobs, where they can get housing, where they can live in community. That was the idea. In practice, it was shut down the, the institutions very, very quickly. We don't have all of the community health needs set up. We don't have the housing set up. We don't have the community health. We don't have any of those things set up that we need to have set up in the community. Just get the people out onto the streets, get them taking the antipsychotics as quickly as you can and get them out. And so the asylums and, and all of those institutions closed down very, very quickly. All of these people that were being quote unquote helped by these medications ended up on the streets. The medications also have very, very severe side effects and a lot of folks weren't able to continue to take them long term or didn't desire to take them long term. And so you had people that were still very, very ill, people that weren't able to take the medications out in the community with no plans for catching them, with no health, with no housing and with no social programs. And so we ended up with a lot of very seriously mentally ill people not caught by the system. And it was in the kind of well, late 90s, early 2000s that really I find the movement for destigmatization of mental illness really started up with campaigns um, that were aimed at destigmatizing mental illness, that were aimed at normalizing talking of, uh, you know, talking therapies and things like using antidepressants. So with the push and think what you will of big pharma, but with the push about Prozac and, and, and SSRIs and, you know, people started to talk a little bit more about mental health and mental illness, Some more popular movies started to come out. And, you know, this like, this has been going, this is a train that has been running for a long time is basically my point. And so to say that we're, we're talking more about mental health now than we ever have in the past is absolutely true. We're talking more about destigmatizing mental health and mental illness, but the, the struggle is not over. Um, the struggle is far from over. The, the struggle really, so we have a, a younger generation, and I, I just saw an article about this yesterday, a younger generation that is, they, they're more willing to talk about mental illness than they ever have been in the past. And they're destigmatizing mental illness for other people, but the self-stigma is still as high as it's ever been. They shouldn't succumb to mental illness. They shouldn't ask for accommodations in learning and in jobs for mental illness. They shouldn't be ones that struggle. They should be perfect. They should be achieving. They should be, you know, doing all of the things. It's okay for other people and we'll talk about it and we'll make accommodations for them, but not for me. And as I've said before, the scourge of self-stigma is, I think, worse than a lot of the mental illnesses that people are struggling with. It's the self-stigma that, that makes their experience of life so much worse. I, mean, I know it makes mine so much worse. And so, yes, we're talking about it. We haven't solved the problems. We haven't solved the social problem, the homelessness problem, which is largely tied to mental health and mental illness in our society is far from solved. It seems to be getting worse, particularly with COVID, it's getting worse. Mental health and mental health programs aren't getting much better and COVID has made them much worse, arguably. And so why do we need, ultimately getting to the point, why do we need Mental Health Awareness Week and Mental Illness Awareness Week? Why do we need it twice a year? Why do we need to do this? For those of you in Canada, why do we need Bell Let's Talk Day in January? Because the conversation is really only getting started. Yes, we're more aware of mental health and mental illness than ever before. Yes, it's a buzzword in industry and in society and on, on social media, but buzzwords don't necessarily make change. Buzzwords make 
you know, nice frilly programs that everybody talks about, but they don't necessarily make life better for people that are living with mental illness. And so that is why we need these special weeks, these special days. That is why we need the Pride Month and Pride Parades. It's the same thing. The struggle for LGBTQ2 rights didn't end at Stonewall. It didn't end when, you know, it was decriminalized or taken out of the DSM. It didn't end then. It's really, it's still going on. These struggles, these, these civil rights struggles, basically, are still going on. And so that's why we need this, these special weeks. And so this Mental Illness Awareness Week, there's plenty going on in your community. If you're in Canada and you don't know what's going on, check out the Canadian Mental Health Association, the CMHA, um, or the uh, Mental Health Commission of Canada, the MHCC, for information on what might be going on in your community. If you are in the United States, NAMI is a good place to go, so the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, and you, there will also be community events going on in your region. You know. Get involved. Go and see. Maybe there's volunteer opportunities for you. Maybe there's a distress line or a distress center that you might be able to volunteer at. Maybe you can donate. Maybe you can do something to help people living with mental illness and their families and their communities who are struggling with this very, very real and very, very relevant social uh, problem. So that's what I wanted to say. This week you're going to see from me uh, kind of a callback to some of my videos from the past um, that maybe deserve some more attention or maybe are more popular and I want to uh, make sure you have an opportunity to view them. So uh, check out my social media for links to those videos and I will see you for my video next week. Take care. Happy Mental Illness Awareness Week. Bye. Stigma Crusher